Welcome back to the History Fix. We are going to return to Europe uh, this time and I'm going to focus on what is happening in Europe in the 16th century and I want to remind you of some of the things that I was saying um, a few episodes back now about the Reformation and the enormous significance of the Reformation not just for European history but for world history. Through the 16th century and actually well into the 17th century. It really kicks off in 1517 and it's not really reached a conclusion until 1660. Through this long period of just under 150 years, there's a confrontation across Europe between the forces of the Protestant Reformation and the forces of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. And the issues at stake are hugely important. It was not just a matter of religion. Uh, religion uh, was central to it because religion was the language in which human beings at that time, Europeans at that time, uh, discussed their problems, discussed their position in the world, discussed the form of the society that they were living in, discussed what they thought about different political regimes. It was all couched in a religious language, but there were underlying economic and social and political issues at stake. That's why the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation mattered so much. The essence of it was this. The Catholic Church was closely tied to the old feudal elites of the medieval period. Um, the church was dominated by the Pope, the cardinals, the bishops and the priests. Uh, the language of religion, the language of Catholic services was Latin, which was incomprehensible to most of the people who were attending uh, services. The expectation was that the ecclesiastical hierarchy would tell people what to think and what not to think, what they should and they shouldn't do. There was no expectation at all that people would be thinking for themselves and church services were dominated by uh, hymns and prayers and incantations and the use of incense and archaic ritual and so on. This was um, a religion in which a kind of mindlessness, um, a timeless mindlessness was really fossilized in the rituals of the church. The church also incidentally was extremely corrupt. It was a big, big landowner. It was one of the dominant landowners of the medieval period right the way across uh, Europe. And there were huge levels of corruption, particularly at the top of the church. Contrast this with the Reformation. And what's the essence of what the Protestants are saying? It is that people should not be simply obeying the authority of corrupt clerics imposed upon them. They shouldn't simply be participating in rituals in a foreign language, uh, a dead language, Lat church Latin, which they didn't, uh, which didn't understand. They shouldn't be worshipping uh, blocks of painted wood, statues, or paintings, or mosaics, or whatever, icons hanging on the walls um, of churches, what they should really be doing is engaging directly with the Word of God, which meant, of course, being able to read the Bible, or at least to hear the Bible stories told to them in a language that they could understand, their own language, and they should be engaging in a serious discussion about the meaning of God's Word, the meaning of Scripture. What's the real underlying religious message? Now, why does that matter uh, in the 16th century? It matters because the world is changing. And when the world is changing, the received dogmas of the past no longer fit. You need to have the opportunity to reevaluate, to reassess the re re religious message, to reinterpret 
the religious message, if you like, in keeping with the changing times of which you are part. And for that reason, the more conservative feudal social classes of 16th century Europe, they were the ones that remained essentially uh, Catholic because they didn't want anything to change. They weren't part of the changes that were underway. And it was the, the new forces, particularly the middling sort, but the, uh, the traders, the merchants, the bankers, the craft workers, the minor gentry improving their estates, the yeoman farmers seeking to improve uh, their plots and so on. It's the new enterprising classes that are beginning to create a new kind of commercial, if you like, proto-capitalist, early capitalist economy who are changing the world and as they engage in that project are really wanting to discuss uh, the nature of the society, the nature of the political setup um, uh, which rules over them. The Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, is the mechanism whereby you do that. And that's why it shakes Europe in the 16th century to its foundations. Now, I want to illustrate that by contrasting two very different societies. The Spanish Empire on the one hand and the Dutch Republic as it becomes on the other. Let's start with the Spanish Empire. This is the heyday, the 16th century, the heyday of imperial Spain. It's the one moment really in history where Spain becomes the dominant global power. We can sort of put dates on it, I think, from 1492 to 1588. That's, the, that's really the Spanish century when the whole of Europe really is threatened by the power of Spanish armies. The marriage of uh, Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile had made it possible at the end of the uh, 15th century to unite the two main kingdoms in the Iberian Peninsula. Ferdinand and Isabella had then completed the reconquest of uh, Spain, uh, driving the Moors uh, the Muslims out of the south, so they create, for the first time really, a united Spanish uh, monarchy that dominates virtually the whole of the peninsula, not Portugal, but all of the rest of it. And they establish a, a monarchical absolutism, a kind of royal uh, dictatorship, and it's quite ruthless. Um, the old uh, feudal lords are brought to heel. Uh, the parliaments and the law courts and the municipalities, they're all brought under effective uh, royal control. An inquisition is set up, um, and the inquisition is effectively a secret police force. Um, it is designed to enforce uh, conformity and uh, obedience. Um, those who, uh, who oppose the regime, dissidents, they're branded as heretics and they are persecuted. Uh, they're put into prison, they're tortured, they're sometimes burnt um, at the stake in grotesque rituals of state and church power. This is what we would call today a police uh, state, a police dictatorship, and needless to say, Spain becomes in the 16th century the great center of the, Cath the counter-reformation, the Catholic uh, response to uh, the Protestant Reformation in the north. That's imperial Spain, ruled in the uh, second half of the 16th century by Philip II. And Philip II, as a dynastic ruler, he controlled territories in other parts of Europe, including the Low Countries what we now know as uh, Holland or the Netherlands and Belgium, the Low Countries were under Spanish rule, under the rule of Philip uh, II in the uh, latter part of the 16th century. Holland, and uh, it's particularly Holland, less so what, what is now Belgium, it's particularly Holland, but to some degree Belgium as well, was a very different sort of place, could hardly have been more different from the Spanish Empire. That's really bound up with the fact that this was a part of the world which was uh, very much focused on the sea, 
very much focused on overseas uh, trade, on commerce. Um, if you think about Holland, uh, Holland is largely, or a large part of it anyway, is below uh, sea level. And it depended, it was, it was actually being created at the time, really. Holland as we know it today was being created to a large degree in the 16th century by Dutch engineers who were digging dikes all over and were reclaiming uh, the land. Um, so Holland really is a very low-lying area with deep estuaries, lots of rivers, uh, lots of uh, drainage dikes, and very much a focus on trade. And all over Holland in the 16th century and to a degree Belgium uh, to the south, there were small but very prosperous uh, late medieval, early modern towns populated by merchants and traders and craft workers and money lenders and so on. People who were very much networked into this new, growing, money-based, commercial, trade-based, trade-oriented um, economy which was developing particularly at this time in northwestern Europe. And this is fertile ground for the Reformation. The, the Dutch burghers, the Dutch townsmen, the Dutch seafarers, the Dutch merchants are exactly the kind of people who find the message of the Protestant Reformation particularly attractive. So all over the Low Countries in the 16th century you get conversion from Catholicism to one form of Protestantism or another, usually Calvinism, a more moderate form of Protestantism, or Anabaptism, um, a more radical uh, form of Protestant uh, Reformation. The imposition of and the experience of Spanish colonial rule in the Low Countries was increasingly resented um, in the 16th uh, century because it meant restrictions on trade, it meant taxes, paying taxes to the Spanish authorities, but increasingly also it meant a conflict over religion as the Spanish king attempted to impose religious conformity as a way of uh, ensuring that there was obedience to the colonial authorities. This exploded into revolution in 1566. And there's a sense in which the very first bourgeois revolution, there's going to be a whole series of bourgeois revolutions all over the world right up into the 20th century. But in a sense, the first, the world's first bourgeois revolution, the first revolution of, if you like, the middle class, the trading class, the merchant classes emerging at this time, it kicks off um, in the Low Countries in 1566. And it runs and runs and runs. Um, we can't, we don't have time to talk about the, the details of the fighting, the successive campaigns, the many battles and sieges. Suffice to say, that conflict lasts from 1566 to 1609 with maximum ferocity and to some degree it continues on into right up until 1648. Um, it's sometimes called in Dutch history the 80 years uh, war. It's a conflict which seesaws backwards and forwards. It's a conflict which is a long, drawn-out, vicious, savage um, war of attrition, often with terrible atrocities being committed, particularly by the counter-revolutionary forces, the counter-reformation forces of the um, Spanish king. And it lasts for so long uh, partly because uh, the Dutch are adept at defending uh, their towns and their villages and their dikes. Um, it's a terrain which it's very difficult uh, to penetrate um, and conquer for a foreign invading army. It lasts for a long time because the Dutch are so resilient and of course they are inspired by the sense that they are fighting for what they consider to be uh, the true uh, religion as well as fighting for their independence and their uh, freedom. But the Spanish have almost limitless resources. So each time the Spanish are knocked back, they're able to raise a new army and invade uh, again. 
and crucial to this is the fact that the Spanish, as well as creating a united, centralised, absolute monarchy in the Iberian Peninsula, they have also, at this time, conquered a large part of the New World, a large part of Central and South America, and that is a source of bullion, of gold and silver, coming across the Atlantic every single year are Spanish galleons filled with gold and silver and this flooding of um, the European market with gold and silver, which is what it leads to, is because the Spanish monarchs are using the gold and silver to pay soldiers, to buy armies. Um, so, so if you like, the, 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 the Dutch Revolution um, confronts uh, successive armies of Spanish mercenary soldiers, paid Spanish soldiers, who are sustained by the gold from the New World. The, the counter-revolution in Europe in the 16th century is effectively funded by um, gold from the New World. That means it's possible for the war to be endlessly renewed, so it goes on for a very long time indeed. Nonetheless, there are one or two occasions where the Spanish come close to completing uh, a campaign of conquest that would finally completely destroy the Dutch Republic. What rescues the Dutch Republic when it's, when it's driven right back with its back to the wall is the intervention of the English. Now I'm going to have quite a bit to say about the English next time, but I want to bring them into my story now because if it had not been the case that the English had also had a Reformation, had also become uh, Protestant, and therefore came uh, into the war at crucial moments on the side of their Dutch co-religionists, it's very likely that the bourgeois revolution in Holland would have gone down to defeat at the hands of the Spanish soldiers. This, of course, provides the context for a very famous uh, event in English history, which is the Spanish Armada of 1588, which was an attempt by Philip II, by the Spanish king, to uh, invade and conquer the Protestant England of Queen Elizabeth I. And what prompted him to do that was the fact that the English were intervening on the side of the Dutch rebels. This alliance between Protestant Dutch and Protestant English means that the Reformation survives in the northwestern part of Europe, creating the basis for the building of uh, a capitalist economy uh, based on overseas trade, based on shipping, both in Holland, which experiences a golden age, in the late 16th and early 17th century, and more importantly, in the British Isles. More importantly in the British Isles, because the British Isles was that much bigger, and therefore in the long run at least, had the potential to have a much more transformative impact on the development of the world in the years following the successful outcome of these great conflicts that I'm talking about in relation to Reformation Europe. We're going to come back and look in more detail at the Reformation uh, in England next time, leading up to the moment when England also experiences a bourgeois revolution in the middle of the 17th century. That's on the History Fix next time. We are facing the greatest crisis in the history of humanity. Capitalism is driving us towards climate catastrophe. To understand how we got here and how we get out of it, we really need to understand human history. What we're trying to do here at The History Fix is to give us the understanding of the past that we need to equip us to fight for a better future. If you like what we're doing, please share and subscribe and also contribute to our Patreon page. Thanks very much.